Right, so we are going to continue in our series that we started last week. And if you missed last week's message, uh, please get online, watch that, you can listen to that. You can, we have many ways that you can do that. You can go online, you can um, subscribe to our podcast and you'll get instant downloads. You can go on YouTube and watch it or you can just go straight to our website and you can listen or um, uh, watch it there. But basically last week we talked about this first meal in the Bible that, that ultimately that went kind of wrong, that made everything how it is now. We talked about that we live now in a Genesis 3 world where God created us to be in relationship with him, where God created us to be in relationship with one another. But when Adam and Eve, they messed up, when sin came into the world, actually what happened is, is that relationships became hard, that they became broken, that things, that shame and regret and conflict kind of came into the world. And what I, what I left you with, the, the taste I wanted to leave you with in your mouths was this, this fact of that even though relationships are hard, even though that there will be pain, and even though there is awkwardness in everyday life, will we decide we can't be bothered, and actually we, want, we don't want to get hurt, and therefore we're just going to stay on our own? Or are we going to push through for what God has got for us, and pursue relationship with one another. You see, and, and God's kind of, God's ended. We ended last time with even though things were, were rubbish, you know, things were great, and then all of a sudden, Adam and Eve messed up and things were rubbish, but God didn't leave it without hope, did he? First off, we said, we remember, he, he, the Adam and Eve, they felt shame, and God made a sacrifice, made the first sacrifice, killing an animal and using its skin to cover their shame. And then he also promised to the man and the woman, he said, from you, from you one day will come one who will crush the serpent's head, who will crush evil, who will crush sin, who will defeat sin and death. And we look forward to that time. And so the, the timeline kind of goes on from there. You know, Adam and Eve, they, they have children, and uh, they have children, and they have children, and they have children. And then eventually we get to Abraham and Sarah, and Abraham and Sarah, um, there God calls them out of, of um, Ur of the Chaldeans, which is like a rock now, and he calls them out and he says, I'm going to make, I'm going to set you apart, and from you, you are going to bless the world, from, from your people will come that special one. And then he has, they have Isaac and, uh, Isaac, and Isaac marries Rebecca, and they have Jacob, and Jacob is this Really, he's this awful person. If you've got this impression of the Bible and Bible characters as these amazing people that we should also aspire to be like, read Jacob because he is awful. He's an awful person in every sort of sense of the way. He's a he's a he's cunning. He's tricked. He's a trickster. And I mean, he even gets he eventually kind of I, I, the irony of the story goes that he gets tricked himself. He falls in love with with um, Rachel. He works to, to, um, so that he can marry Rachel, and then on the wedding day, I mean, she, she must be wearing complete head-to-toe cover so you can't see who she is. He marries this woman and finds out it's not Rachel, it's her sister. So he's completely duped. He then ends up marrying his, his Rachel as well. Rachel and Leah, they kind of get into this sister's kind of fight over who can have the most children, which then means that they suggest to Jacob that he might um, end up marrying their servants so that they can produce children for them. Being the man of character that he is, he says, why not? And uh, so he ends up having four wives, and then he has 12 sons. And of those 12 sons, he's a rubbish dad. And he ends up picking favourites. And then he ends up, oh, if you remember um, Joseph in his Technicolor dream coat, he, he chooses Joseph out of all his sons. This, this guy here, you probably can't see it all the way back there, but I've drawn special lines on it to depict to, 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 to that it's multicolored. Um, but anyway. He picks, the, he picks him as his favourite son, and this, this guy kind of grows up being a bit of an arrogant little so-and-so, and he has dreams, and he tells everyone that you're going to serve me or whatever, and also, basically, basically, by the end, his brothers are like, we're going to kill this little guy, we're going to kill him, and then, then one of them has, has some sense, he goes, actually, let's not kill him, let's do the, the much kinder thing, and uh, send him into slavery. So they decide to send it, if that's the kind of, but they decide to send it, sell him into slavery down into Egypt. And he's very sad. And he goes into Egypt, he's really sad. Um, he then becomes a slave in Egypt. And then eventually he, he is uh, falsely accused of something that he didn't do. And he's made, he's put in prison. And he spends, his, he spends years and years of his life in prison. But whilst in prison, he meets these two guys who have a dream. 
well, they both have separate dreams. But one of them is the, is, is the baker, and, it, and he tells him that his dream means that, sorry kid, you're going to die. And he does. And then the other one uh, is, is the cupbearer to the king, the pharaoh, and he tells him that this dream means that you're going to be reinstalled to your status. But when this happens, please remember me. Please do something. Get me out of here. You're going to know the king. You're, you're going to know the most powerful person in the world. Please use that to get me out of here. And that does come true. He does get out, but he forgets all about Joseph. And then years pass, and then all of a sudden, Pharaoh gets woken up by the night by this, this, this crazy dream of, of, of seven, thin cow, seven fat cows and seven thin cows. And the seven fat thin cows eat the seven fat cows. And um, he's like, what does it mean? This obviously means something. And then the cupbearer remembers really quickly that, that, oh yeah, I remember this guy when I was in prison. I wonder if he, could, he took my dream, it came true. I wonder if he can take this dream. And so he, he, they send for Joseph, Joseph interprets the dream, says that you're going to have seven years of plenty, followed by seven years of famine. And the seven years of famine are going to outweigh the years of plenty. And then he kind of steps up and he says, so what I'd do if I was you, I'd set up people to gather in the grain and to, and to store it so that in those times of, plenty, in those times of, of, um, of famine, we've got enough. And his Pharaoh goes, great. That's exactly what I'm going to do, and you're going to be the guy. And he makes, he makes Joseph his, his kind of the most powerful person in the world other than himself. And uh, this, this is like hundreds of years of history, by the way. I'm trying to do it in like 30 seconds. Um, and so Joseph, Joseph is there. Joseph is the most powerful person in the world, except for Pharaoh. Famine comes. The Egypt has got lots of food. Nowhere else does. And so his family, who live in Canaan, are also suffering with this famine. They come down to Egypt to beg for food, and who, who do they meet? Joseph. Well, they don't know it's Joseph because he's all dressed up and got this headgear and stuff, and they expect him to be dead. But they meet with him. He eventually reveals himself to them as their brother. They apologize to him for trying to, for trying to kill him and send him off into slavery. He accepts their apology and says, um, you know, come, come and live with us. Come and bring the whole family down here with us. And so they do. Everyone comes down. They have a great big family re reunion. And they live in Egypt. And they prosper. And they thrive. And, and they, they, the, the, this, this small group of people then multiply and multiply and become a massive group of people. And then time goes on. And a new pharaoh is in charge. And pharaoh basically sees all these immigrants. And he thinks... I don't want all these people living in my land. They're going to live in my land. They're not going to prosper. They are going to serve us. So he forces them to be his slaves. And so they're all really sad. They're all his slaves. And they all decide that they're going to, they all cry out to God. And it says they cry out to God. They cry out to God for hundreds of years. They cry out to God and ask him to, to do something, to move in their situation. And just like we've been saying this morning uh, during our, our time of worship, actually God hears us. It says that God hit, heard their cry. God heard their cry. And, and uh, whatever you were praying for, what, what, whether, whatever you were asking God for, the Bible says that God hears you. And that's the truth. Jesus hears us. He is there with us. He loves us. And so eventually, God, God raises up um, someone to, 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 um, to, 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 to do something. You see, what happens is Pharaoh basically, basically eventually says, there's too many of these slaves. I need to get rid of them. So he starts having a cull. What he says is that he's going to kill the, first, the, the, the sons of um, these, the, these Israelites. He's going to kill. So as they're born, he says, oh, I'm going to kill. If, if you're a midwife, your duty is to kill the, the, the sons. And they would throw them in, into the Nile. And lo and behold, one guy is born called Moses. He's, he's born and his parents managed to keep him alive. But as, well, as he becomes too big to be able to hide anymore, they eventually send him in the river. And lo and behold, he's found by Pharaoh's own daughter, who decides she wants to raise him as her own child. But because she's not had children, she doesn't know how to raise him, she can't. And so she goes and gets, she goes and asks a little girl, who happens to be Moses' sister, to um, find a woman who's just had a baby who could raise Moses for her. Happens to be a mother, amazing. The mother gets paid to raise her own child. So Moses grows up, and, and he, he knows all about his people, and he eventually sees his people being mistreated one day. He gets angry, and he kills the guy who's mistreating his people, to which, he go, which, to which he's then found out, to which he goes on the run. He runs away, and whilst he's on, on the run, God meets him. God meets him in the, in the wilderness. He meets him in, in what you might know as the burning bush or the burning tree. It's, it's the same word in Hebrew. It's all the same thing. 
But um, it's, it, it kind of, it kind of, kind of, as I was talking about themes last week, it kind of echoes back to the tree in the garden, the tree of life. In the, now we come to this, this, this tree that seems to be on fire with, with God's, God's presence and God starts speaking to him and God commissions him and tells Moses to go back to Egypt and tell the people, tell, tell Pharaoh to let his people go. And if you know the story, if you use the uh, musical, you know, let my people go uh, on to Jesus. Yeah. Um, he says no every single time. He says no, no, no. And um, Mo- Moses sent, um, not Moses, God sends all these different plagues. Um, every time Moses, every time Pharaoh says no, he sends a new plague. And then, and then Pharaoh would say, okay, you can go. And the plague would go. And then Mo- God, and then Pharaoh would say, no, they can't go. And each one of these plagues is, is amazing. It's 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 a it's a it's a real um, kind of kick in the teeth of the Egyptians, really, because each of these plagues they point out that God is more powerful than their gods. That God is more powerful than everything else. So they they worship the Nile. The Nile is the source of their their life, and it turns to blood. Useless. You know they. They, 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 they would pray, they'd make sacrifices so they'd have a harvest, so the harvest would come in well. Locusts come and eat the harvest. They, they, one of the most powerful gods was, was the sun god. And, and, and they, they, they believed that every day the sun god would have a battle with evil and it would appear in the sky victorious. And then one day it's blackened out, showing that, that, that it is, it, God has more power over their God. And actually, what that, that shows is actually for them, God has power, God had power over their gods, but actually for us, every obstacle that we face, everything that we come across, everything that we think, this is too big, or I, I'm gonna trust in money or whatever, it's saying that God is more powerful than all those things. God is more trustworthy than any of those things that we put our trust in. And so eventually, it comes to the last plague, and we come to our meal today. The last plague, which is, God says eventually, okay, I'm going to kill the firstborn son of every single Egyptian. I'm going to kill everyone, every firstborn son of those who live in the land. But for you, for you Moses, for your people, if you take a lamb and you sacrifice it, and you eat the lamb, and you, t- you put its blood on your doorposts, that night that the angel of death comes, it will go over your house, it will pass over, that's where the name comes from, it will pass over your house, your place, it will see that a sacrifice has been made, and leave your, you alone. But for those where a sacrifice hasn't been made, where a lamb hasn't been sacrificed, there will be <coughs> the, 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 the firstborn son, with firstborn will die. And this is exactly what happens. They're told to, to eat this meal in haste. They're told to wear their sandals. They're to, told to eat it in a rush because something's going to happen. Something's going to happen. And that night there must have been screams. There must have been crying as household after household loses someone that they love. But not over the houses where the, where the lamb has been sacrificed. And then Pharaoh says... Get out of it. Go. Go. You can go. So they leave. They leave in their droves. They leave with, with possessions. They leave with more, more stuff than they, they came with. They, they leave with, with, with as this is Egyptians as well, leave with them. And, and as you know, if you know the story, you know, they leave and then they, they, they get to this, this, this sea, this great sea, this, the Red Sea or the, the Sea of Reeds. And as they get there, Pharaoh decides, no. I don't want them to go. They must come back. They must pay for what, what, what has happened. So he runs after them with his chariots. And, and miraculously, God makes the, the sea, the waters, um, pile up, makes the waters part. And the Israelites can walk through the waters. And as, as, as they get across to the other side, the Egyptians start running through the dry land where the waters had gone. And to only for God to let the waters crash down and destroy them once again. And they are finally free. They are finally set free from their captors. Finally set free from, 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 from their slavery. And what the Bible says is in the same way, you and I have been set free. You and I have been set free from captives. You and I have been set free from, from, from the world. The Bible says that we have been set free from the, the world, from sin and death. And we've been set free to a new life of freedom. 
And I'm not going to get into it this week, we'll talk about it in a few weeks' time, but, but if you read the story and what, what, it, what the Jewish people would do is year in, year out, they would celebrate this meal. And as they celebrated this meal, they would tell the story of the exile, tell the story of the, of the exodus, of what God did. And it's left you kind of every single time thinking, something's going to happen. Something's going to happen. That, that, we, that some, something, God's, God's going to bring us a greater freedom. And it has something to do with the blood of a lamb. It has something to do with the blood of a lamb. It kind of leaves us, leaves us with that, this kind of, um, if you've never read the Bible before, if you've never read these stories before, it's meant to leave you with a sense of there's a greater freedom to come. And it's to, something to do with the blood of a lamb. <clears throat> and so we're told that we are free. That if you are in Christ, the New Testament tells us that we are free. And like I said, we're going to look at that in a couple of weeks of how Jesus has bought our freedom. But um, just for this morning, I want to read uh, a few, few lines from Galatians. And uh, Galatians 5.1 says this. It says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. You see, see, like I said, we were once enslaved. If you, if you weren't a Christian, you, the, it's, the Bible says that we were once enslaved. We were once enslaved to the world. We were once imprisoned by, by, by sin and death. We once wanted to, we only wanted, only wanted to do what, what, what was against what God wanted us to do. We, we were, and therefore, because of this in slavery, we were under judgment. We were under, under, under condemnation from God because we weren't living for him. But somehow, because of blood, through Christ, we have now been set free. And actually, Romans 6, Paul says in Romans 6, he goes further. He says, once you were slaved, you were enslaved to sin. Now you have a new slave master. You are a slave to righteousness. And what that means is, it is, is for those of us who are Christians, that means that we have a new master now. We have a new master. Sin was once our master, but we have a new master now. And, and, and with that new master, it is brought freedom. And with freedom comes a new way to live. It's a new way to live. A, a way that, that, like we were saying last week, that because of sin, life is broken. Relationships are broken. But with this new master, there's redemption. That actually you and I can start playing a part in redeeming, of making new, of repairing the brokenness of what is done in Christ. You see, Galatians 5 tells us actually how that happens. Later on, it tells us that actually because we've been made new, because we have a new master now, this new master... Jesus Christ has given us a spirit, has given us his spirit to live inside us. And that spirit is a spirit of love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. He says, against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with their passions and desires. Since we live by the spirit, let us keep in step with the spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. You see, a life under the new master that we now live is freedom. It's freedom. And, and what freedom looks like is where we're able to be loving and kind. And not just nice, but supernaturally loving and kind towards one another, where, where there once was bitterness and resentment. You, they wronged me, I want to wrong them back. They hurt me, I want to hurt them back. No, in Christ, the spirit that Christ gives us is, to even those who have hurt us, I want to supernaturally be kind to them. I want to love them. It means that, that we, we bring peace, that actually we forbear with one another, which I wasn't quite sure what that meant, so I looked it up. And it basically means it's, come, it's, a, it's a financial term. I had no idea, but it's a financial term. It basically means that if you, give, if you owe money to someone, so mortgage or whatever, say, say you know, the bank gives you some money and you owe them money and they say, therefore, you need to, buy, you need to pay us £600 back a month because of what we owe you. And you say, well, I can't pay that. To forbear means they go, well, how much can you pay back? And let, they let you pay back what you can afford. And so, so to forbear with one another is we meet each other where we're at. 
We don't expect high standards of each other when we can't deliver it. We say, actually, no, we, we, we meet you where you're at. We understand what you're going through. Oh, I don't understand what you're going through, but I appreciate that it might be hard, so therefore I'm not going to expect high standards of you that, 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 that you can't achieve. I'm going to meet you where you're at. You know, it means that actually that, that be, being, being, being people of the Spirit, it's actually really countercultural. It's actually completely countercultural. You know, more and more, especially it's been kind of highlighted, especially over the last couple of years. You know, we, we live in this 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 age of council culture, which basically means that you need to agree with me in every single thing I think, otherwise I cannot be your friend. And if you don't agree with me, then therefore I don't agree with anything about you. It means, you know, things, it, it, it has gone on to like TV stuff and, th you know, stuff that used to be on the telly that now is actually, we, some people don't like. It's a bit offensive. So therefore, we erase it. We erase it from existence. That part of someone's life isn't, a, isn't, isn't, isn't a, we don't like that bit. It doesn't stick up to modern values or whatever. So therefore, we get rid of the whole thing. No. No, what, what we are to do with one another is... Actually, the beautiful thing about the church family is you can have different ideas from me. You can decide I'm going to raise my children completely differently to where you raise your children. Actually, secretly, I think the way you raise your children is wrong. And it's okay. We can still be friends. We can still love each other. I'm going to do this. I'm going to put my energy into this. And that's not what you think I should do. And that's okay. We can still love each other. We can still be kind to one another. We can still forbear with one another. We can still, um, we can still be kind and bring peace into those situations. We don't need to see eye to eye. We don't, that's the beautiful thing about the church is that, that, that it is meant to be made of people who are completely different. Not one type of person who believes one type of thing. And if you don't believe that one type of thing, then you need to get out. No, we, 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 the beauty is the difference. You see, we are to be people who accept and love one another. Now, that doesn't mean that we always wholeheartedly trust one another. That's a different thing, okay? You can love and accept someone, but, you know, it means that... But there are certain things in life which we, we do need to have some sort of air level of character if we're going to trust someone. For example, if you... If, if you, um, it, it may, maybe if someone, um, you know, has a trouble with alcohol or, um, or is very angry or whatever, can still love and accept them, might not let them watch my children on their own. Or maybe if you have problems with money, you don't give them your bank account details or whatever like that. It doesn't mean you don't love them, it doesn't mean you don't accept them, and actually we can still be family together, but sometimes there's things of, of trust a level of character which only you can decide needs to come into. But that doesn't mean that we can't still be family together. You see, actually, it can be really hard to, to determine how we, can re how to, uh, how we are to um, act towards each other. But what the Bible shows, shows us is that this life of being free as a Christian from Satan's sin and death and being being under a new master now, Jesus Christ. What, what the Bible shows us, it doesn't just tell us how to do that, actually it shows us. See, we've got, we've got a Lord and Saviour who came down and showed us how to live a life which is loving and accepting and, and, and kind to others. So I've got three examples I'm going to go through quickly of uh, uh, these three stories which I love. Um, that shows us how Jesus acted and kind of ho hopefully will help us show how we can act towards one another. As the first example is a blind man. Now there was this blind man. Uh, in, in John chapter 9 we read about this blind man who's been blind from birth and, um, and basically he's, he's blind there and Jesus, uh, Jesus walks by him one day with his disciples. His disciples say, why is this guy blind? Is it because he's an awful person or is it because his parents were awful people? And, that, and Jesus said, neither. It's so I can be glorified in this moment. And he goes, to the, he goes before him, spits on the ground, grabs, some, grabs the, the mud that's made from the dirt and the spit. And imagine being blind and then all of a sudden getting this kind of wet stuff on your face. Like, what's that? It's Jesus spit. Um, and, and, and he heals him. He heals him. You see, the disciples, actually, they were just a typical cross-sectional view of what everyone thought. You know, you, you're ill. Therefore, it's because you've done something wrong, or it's because people around you have done something wrong. So anyway, the reason why you're ill and I'm not 
It's because you've done something wrong and I'm okay, I'm right. You know, I'm rich because I've worked hard and, and, and I've got this job because of my working. Now that might be true, but actually there's a sense that there's a grace of God in that as well. And therefore, but the danger of that is we can look down and say, well, you're not rich. You don't have stuff that I have because, well, you're obviously an awful person and you don't deserve it. And that's completely rubbish. So what Jesus does, rather this guy who was an outcast due to his disability, Jesus accepts him. He comes up to him. He loves him. He heals him, physically heals his sight. And he restores his relationship with others and with God. The next person... It's a guy I love, Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, he's also an outcast, but not because of disability. He's an outcast because of his job title, because he is, he, he's a tax collector, which means he worked for the oppressing government. He worked for those who, who came in, the Romans who come in and oppressed and, and, and lorded it over the people. And he not only worked for them, but he said he was rich. And the only way he got rich wasn't because his job paid well. He was rich because he would take from you more than what he was meant to. And you could do nothing about it. So he'd take from you. He was greedy. He was working for the authorities. And everyone hated him. Everyone shunned him. So much that if he wanted to see Jesus, when Jesus came to town, he had to climb up a tree just to get a, to get a sneaky peek at Jesus. And what does Jesus do? Jesus accepts him. Jesus actually stops, looks up at him and says, Zacchaeus, I want to come to your house. Which, is, as we said last week, was a massive thing. I mean, it's one thing to say hi. I mean, that was awful. To say hi to this man. But not just to say hi. To say, actually, I want to come to your house. I want to share my life with you. I want to know who you are. I want to know what you're like. And I want you to know who I'm like. And people were incensed by this. You want to go and spend time with Zacchaeus? He's an outcast. He's an awful person. He accepts him. He heals him. He doesn't, he doesn't physically heal him, but we see by the end of this story, Zacchaeus, who was greedy, who, who, who stole from his fellow people, what does he say at the end? I want to give to anyone who I've wronged. Basically, I want to give away everything I've got but to give back to those around me. His, his, this, this heart of greed is healed and becomes a heart of generosity. And he's, he's restored. Because of Jesus, he's restored in relationship with, with, with people and with God. And then finally, we see this woman who's at a well. Jesus, he's passing from Judea in the south to Galilee in the north. And in the middle, in the Midlands, is this place called Samaria. And they were hated. Everyone hated them. All good Jews learned to hate them. It's kind of like I was saying the other day um, about now Blackpool got promoted. They will be in the same league as Preston, Preston North End. And um, kind of... This season, in the last couple of seasons, they've been in the same league as Fleetwood, which has been kind of a bit of embarrassment for Blackpool. But next year, they're going to be in the same, same league as Preston, which it, there's, there's a real rivalry there with them and Preston. And, and when I used to work in Preston, if, if you were, walked into a wholesaler's um, a, 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 as a tradesman and someone would mention in Preston, someone would mention Blackpool, it was like Blackpool. <laughs> You know, it's just it's literally just spit on the ground. And it's, and it's similar here, you know, people, people mention Preston, it's like spit on the ground. Because it, 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 there's like a real, especially in sport, there's a real kind of rivalry of being, um, being at close towns together, and especially with the, the history. And, and, and there's that kind of times a hundred between the Jews and the Samaritans. And so Jesus walks through this area and he meets this woman called, uh, this, woman, this woman who's coming to a well. And she is an outcast in many, many ways. She's an outcast, firstly, because she's a woman. Jesus should not be talking to a woman. Women will look down on in his day, and not, not, you know, Jews would pray, thank you that I'm not, not a woman. I mean, awful, but that's what they did. Secondly, she was, she, was, um, she was a Samaritan. As I said, Jews don't mix with Samaritans. She was the wrong race, she was the wrong sex. And then thirdly, she was promiscuous. It says that she had had several husbands, which meant that she was an outcast from her outcast people. And so she was coming to the well in the middle of the day when everyone else came in the early morning or the early evening when it was cool because no one else wanted to be around her. And actually, she didn't want to be around anyone else because she would have been sick and tired and, and just hurt by the comments that she would get. And Jesus, what does he do? He accepts her. He loves her. He speaks to her. He engages with her. He makes her feel welcome. He heals her. Again, not physically, 
But, well, actually, I think there probably would have been a physical healing here because actually she probably came to the well like this, shoulder slumped, really ashamed of herself. And, you know, people are carrying real shame. You can see it. But it says when, by the time she left, this person who was trying to hide her past, hide her shame, was, 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 was ashamed to be alive. She, it says she left and she runs into the town going, come and meet this guy who told me everything I ever, I ever did. You know, I've been an awful person, but and this is who I'm like, and come and meet Jesus who forgives me, who knows all about it, and he still loves me. Her shame turns to joy. Her shame, she, she's just proclaiming actually how awful she's been because she knows how much glory it brings to Jesus. There's so much healing, and Jesus restores her. You see, so for us, for us to be a people who, who, who are now no longer under the old master, but have a new master, Jesus, what it means to live is that we too, we too accept each other. We accept, actually, we, we, we are a people who are loving and kind. And what I want to ask you is not to say, well, that's great what Jesus was like, but ask you, leave you with these, ta- these three tastes in your mouth. Firstly, how can you, how can you make others feel welcome? How can you help others feel welcome? See, what, where you, what you do. See, how, you know, when, when, when Jen and I, when we, were, when we um, moved up to Manchester first, we visited two churches. And the first church, we walk, well, walked in, no one spoke to us. There was, they had a welcome table. So we decided we'd go and stand by the welcome table. Still no one came up to us. And uh, we decided we weren't going back to that church. It was a great church in the sense of like, all, it believed everything we believed. It did, it kind of had all the same values as we'd have, but no one really wanted to be our friends, it felt like. Then we went to another church, which we ended up spending the next five years at, who everyone wanted to talk to us, it felt like. People invited us back to dinner. People wanted to know about, people were interested in us. And do you know what? You can do that. You can do that. You see, when, when we're asking people to, to serve, to, to help out, to, to welcome, to set up, to help with kids, what we're asking is not for you to just do a mundane job, but you to help others feel accepted. You see, when, if you stand outside, what you're doing is when someone shows up in the car park for the first time, they're like, is this the right place? I'm not really sure. No. Where am I going to go from here? If there's a smiling face out there going, oh, you, you're here for the church? Yeah, we're just down here. That makes it feel so much better, so much at ease. You know, if, if things, if you're, on, if you're on the laptop and you're doing the words, you're not just doing words, what you're doing is you're making, you're making people feel at ease because when we're singing songs that no one has a clue what they are, the words are up there and you feel, oh, okay, I don't feel so left out. When you're looking after the kids, if someone comes with their kids and they have a great time because they've been looked after, they've been loved, I mean, as a parent, that you feel you almost don't care how you've been been treated. If your if your kids have been looked after, you feel so accepted. And these are things that you can all do. These these are things that we can all do. We can we can we can participate in healing others. Yes, people will come in with physical needs, which we can pray for. But we can spend time and give energy to others, which will help others be. Res- be, be healed from many different things. And finally, you know, how can you help restore others into relationship with God? And again, that's just that's just, just being friends with people. That's speaking truth, that's pointing others to Jesus. You see, in God's economy, in God's economy. The sad thing is, is that when we are enslaved, what happens is, is we enslave others. And we can be so tempted to turn back and try and do that, whether that's through unforgiveness or I'm not going to be your friend because you don't agree with me. But actually, what God calls us to do under the new master calls us to do, what Jesus calls us to do, and what Jesus has freed us to do, is that free people free others. That's you free others by the way you act, by the way you love, by the way you, you, you interact with others. So my challenge for you all is maybe go through these questions, ask yourself, how can I do this? But maybe just a simple one is, I just want to encourage you. 
I want to encourage us. You know, part of my, what, what I want, uh, I met with a, um, um, a guy this week uh, who, who, asked us, who asked me, like, what kind of culture do you want in this church? And I said, actually, what I want is for us to be outrageously kind and it's to be fun. Actually, I can't do that on my own, but all, everyone together can play a part in that. So I'm going to pray and then we're going to end. So Lord Jesus, I ask you, God, I ask you, God, to make us like Jesus. Make us like Jesus, who was loving, who was accepting, who, was, who healed, who restored. God, you say that because we are now free from the world, we are now your, we are, we are under your mastership, Lord God. We, you are our Lord, that through, through that, that you can do that. Lord Jesus, we don't just sit back and just wait for you to do it, Lord God, but you, you, you have made us to take part in that, to partake in redeeming of this world, to re the redeeming of the brokenness in this world, redeeming of the brokenness in relationship, Lord God. You have called us under, this, under the new master, under Jesus Christ, to play a part in, being, in, in, in restoring relationships. Lord Jesus, and I pray, Lord God, for this church. Lord God, I pray, Jesus, that it would be a place that is fun. Lord God, it would be a place that, that where, where each one of us are just outrageously kind and giving of our time and want to accept and love one another. Even when we completely disagree with each other, we still love and, and, and accept one another. And that's the underlying thing that we accept and love like Jesus. Amen.